the button. Well, welcome. Uh, this is always my favorite conference of the year. Uh, Don said, you know, meet people around you. Uh, the great thing about the PowerShell community is the community. There's fantastic people here, so definitely take time to, to introduce each, you, yourself to each other. Look, we're all geeks. We're all just going to stare at our shoes, break out of that shell, go talk to people. So I thought I'd first talk about the state of PowerShell. And um, uh, I recently, you know, we've been partnering with Chef for a while now, and we've got a great relationship there. And I had a great conversation with their CEO, Barry Crest. And he made a, a, a comment to me when I first met him. And he said, you know, we've been, we've been, hello. <laughs> we've been looking at PowerShell for quite some time now. And the story of PowerShell, he says, is, this, is the story of sustained investment. He says, you know, a lot of times we look at, at Microsoft and we see, you know, you get all frothy about something and you start it and then sort of lost your way and then that goes away. And I think we can all name one or two or 20 of those things. And he said, but PowerShell, you started it and you invested in it and you invested in it and you invested in it and you keep investing in it. And so that's why we decided we were going to take a big bet on you because this seems like a very safe bet to us. We really like what you've done there. And I thought about it, I was like, yeah, that's actually right. That's a great way to think about it. So the story of PowerShell is the story of sustained investment. So let's start about the progression, right? This is very long term, right? Around the Windows 2000, which is not the year 2000, but when Windows 2000, and 2000 was out, I originally wrote the Monad Manifesto. And that was our original vision and prototype. I believe that was in 2002. It took us a while. It took a long time to get PowerShell off the ground. But in the server 2008 time frame, we did PowerShell version 1. Sort of the defining feature of PowerShell version 1 was this idea of .NET command lines. Now, that really undersells it vastly, right? Of course, PowerShell version 1 was a vast thing, right? We had the .NET command lines, of course, but we had the full interactive shell. We had the full language, OK? Uh, we had the object pipeline, we had the object utilities, we had namespaces, the ability to CD into uh, Active Directory, sorry, into, yeah, we had Active Directory, I think, in version one, but if not, we had uh, the cert drive and the registry, et cetera. Uh, we had our debugger, you know, so if you think about most interactive shells, most interactive shells don't have debuggers. <coughs> we had the security, Paid attention to that from the very beginning. We had the adaptive type system, we had help. So our version one was actually quite a substantial version one. And it was one of the benefits of, you know, again, that's a pretty big gap, but one of the benefits of that big gap is when we started, we came to the market with a lot. So as a base system, we had a whole lot of capability. However, what you could do with it was actually pretty rough. We only had, how many commands do we have? I thought it was 129. Yeah, that's right. I think 250 was the next one. It's a very small amount of things. So it was great for the 129 things you could do. By the way, most of those were utilities and get process, of course. We, we just love get process. Anyway, so there wasn't that much you could do. So in, and you could do remoting, of course. So PowerShell version 2, obviously, the defining element of PowerShell version 2 was remoting. You can now do remoting. We invest heavily in that. I'm quite proud of the remoting. Uh, in particular, you know, now PowerShell version 5, uh, PowerShell version 2 will manage PowerShell version 5. PowerShell version 5 will manage PowerShell version 2. And I bet everyone on the team's job that that's true. And the company bets my job that that's true. That's something we take very seriously, that that is always going to work. Um, anyway, so that was kind of the defining thing. But, in fact, we still did a lot more than that. We had script commandlets. So now all of a sudden you could write commandlets as in script in PowerShell. That was one of these fundamental changes in the architecture that allowed us to just really hit the pedal with the next versions, okay? Uh, we, had, we did better help. Help has obviously been a challenge with PowerShell. The original help with MAML, oh my lord, that was very difficult. So we made it easier. Now you can do common-based help. Modules, transactions, data language, splatting, try-catch, block comments, script internationalization, background jobs, eventing, I see, get out. There was a ton of stuff here. Now you'll see now, starting with very, at the very beginning, we've always tried to balance the 
both the programmatic and the interactive, and be a single scripting environment that span the needs of the developers and the operators. In all honesty, if we look at it, we say, well, yes, that's true, but really we're heavily oriented towards the operators. But even as soon as PowerShell version 2, we started to increase our investment to make it more, more friendly to developers. Things like try, catch. I don't know if we did return in version 2 or version 3. Do you remember? Version 1. Version 1? We did in version? Yeah. Okay. When in doubt, ask Lee Holmes. Okay. <laughs> So we improved it in version two with try cache. Okay. Anyway, so uh, the, the defining feature for that was remoting. Version three, really, the, the story, boy, was that a big release. That was a three-year release. Huge release. But everyone walks away from version three realizing, boy, at that release, we crossed the, the gap, you know, crossed the chasm in coverage. We just had fantastic coverage. Again, PowerShell version one, I think 129, PowerShell version two, 200 and some odd. And then PowerShell version 3, I think, 2,500. 2,500 command lines. Now, one of the reasons why was because we had done the CDXML. And this was, gave the Windows guys the ability to write their command lines in, in, in native code, in particular in WI. And then remember I mentioned to you that scripting, you know, to write script command lines. Basically, what we could do is we could reflect against those things and auto-generate command lines. So this idea of metaprogramming. And you're going to see that idea over and over and over again. It's one of the key concepts in PowerShell, this is metaprogramming. Programs which write programs. Jim gave a great talk today about, what did you call it, Simplex? Simplex is a metaprogramming system. You write uh, some uh, program which then generates other programs for providing providers. Really neat stuff. So boy, just look at that list. Uh, workflow, they will help delegates, constraint language, huge, 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 huge release. Uh, landed very, very well. But did we stop? The answer is no. Version 4, we continued on. And version 4 was when we made the big shift and started to go big on desired state configuration. Uh, now this was the first version of desired state configuration. And internally, we refer to this as the .9 release. So we, we, we moved to this model, right? If you're not familiar with the uh, desired state configuration is all about the sort of agile development and trying to have a management system that, that supports that and the sort of cloud-oriented management. So we decided we'd embrace that ourselves and to do what's called a minimal viable product. Minimal viable product is what's the minimal viable product to get people to use the product and then tell us what's next. What's next? What's next? Okay. So instead of us, we thought, you know, version three actually worked out pretty well, but honestly, the the, the mechanics of it were unsound, right? And we spent almost a year kind of planning what we were going to do, and then we did it, and then we validated it for a year. If we were off, you know, it's like, well, just hang in there. Three years from now, I'll fix it. That doesn't sound right. So instead, what we want to do is we want to say, hey, here's this thing. Try it. What do you think? And then you tell me, oh, you don't like this. Oh, great, here's another version. How's that? Oh, well, that's great, but now it's missing this. So we want to move from an agile footing. And that's what you heard Kenneth and Anhil talk today. We got into this agile footing. Well, anyway, so the joke was that desired state configuration is really version 0.9. Uh, you'll see there's an update to um, uh, PowerShell server, update to Windows Server 2012 R2. Uh, what do they call it then? The November update? Yeah, the November update for um, that OS. November and <laughs> Stephen will tell you. The, the key thing was we listened to our customers, right? A lot of people were using it. Morowski was using it. Other people telling us where it wasn't, where it was 0.9, and where it needed to prove. That one really got us to like a 1.5. I mean, it's a really substantial increase. And, and People use it, love it, because it meets their needs. Anyway, so uh, got into desired state configuration, PowerShell version 4, lots of great stuff, but that was really the focus. And then since then, PowerShell version 5, honestly, we're just you know, putting uh, uh, all of our weight behind this DevOps mindset, right? So DevOps is a style of doing management. Uh, the big, obviously, that kind of uh, 
showcase feature of, of DevOps is desired state configuration. Huge investment in that area in this release. Uh, but there's more to it than that. We invested in the PowerShell Package Manager, what used to be known as OneGet, until some guys on the team made the disastrous decision to ask permission from lawyers as to whether they could use that name. It turns out that there's some like septic system company in Spain that has a product called like Get One, and the lawyers were convinced we'd have to pay them millions of dollars to license the name OneGet, so we couldn't do that. So, so thus, uh, PowerShell Package Manager was born. Anyway, so the nice thing about PowerShell Package Manager, if you haven't used it, is the ability to sit on any box and basically get access to all the things you want. So you just sit there and say, hey, give me the sys internal tools. Give me simplex. Oh, by the way, Jim, I, I loaded up your simplex. Right after your talk, right after the talk, I sat there and I said, oh, install module simplex. And it went out to the repository, found it, and installed it. And I'm going to be playing with that tonight. So it's just, it just transforms the experience of PowerShell. So it's about this nice, agile world, okay? So desired state configuration, finding objects. Uh, we did the Azure extension agent, so we're working very closely with the Azure guys. Hey, how can we help you? How can we help people consume more of Azure? Uh, we did the script analyzer, um, using uh, lots of work on security, etc. So tons of investment. The key message I want to point out here is that the story of PowerShell is the story of sustained investment, okay? So, the question is, will it continue? And the answer is, we're all about the cloud, right? The, Microsoft's all about the cloud these days. And with the cloud, it has people's hairs on, hair on fire, and PowerShell is a bucket of water, okay? <laughs> really, and he's like, oh, this is great, I'm going to the cloud, but I need things really, really rapidly. I'm going to the cloud, but I need to recreate things. I'm going to the cloud, but now I've got hundreds of things. I've got thousands of things. Automation, PowerShell, is the bucket of water to put out the hair, that, the fire that's in people's hairs. So the answer is yes, there will be continued investment in PowerShell, but, but honestly, I'm just so wildly enthusiastic about the community. The reality is, is that our contributions are going to be dwarfed by the community contributions. I mean, you've heard a lot about it today, right? Um, just these fantastic things, projects that the community is developing. Uh, and they're going to, in the beginning, you know, we were the provider for most of the important pieces of software in the PowerShell community. There were others, there were other important pieces, but by and large, the large bulk of the, large percentage of the important components were coming from our team. I don't believe that will be the case in a very short period of time. In fact, it might not be the case now. Um, now the community is doing great work. Well, you saw that, right? You saw that on Helen Kenna talked about it. We said, hey, we think it's very important that people support um, uh, uh, unit tests that get on unit tests. And we looked out there and, and the community, Dave Wyatt, was doing fantastic stuff with Pester. And we said, why would we try and recreate that? This is great. Let's just ship his code. And so now, I mean, think about that. Dave's code is shipping in Windows. Just such a wonderful world. So, I mean, I gotta tell you, Dave, you should be, where's Dave, by the way? Yeah, you should be strutting around. I mean, you people should be buying this guy beer. We roll tonight. You will, yeah. I mean, that's just craziness. I mean, how many people outside of Microsoft, I mean, yeah, some other products, maybe you pick up a little code here. But Windows, anyway, that's, that's crazy. So that's great. So there's this explosion in community, community support. Of course, we've always had great community support. And of course, we've had great ISV support. You know, lots of our, the ISVs in our community have great PowerShell support. That continues to grow. <clears throat> and we really achieved critical mass with the uh, coverage with 2012 R2. Uh, and what we're seeing, so, so we see this critical mass of 2012 R2 as our community, our, our, our customer base, adopts the later versions of the OS. Look, if you're, if you're an IT pro and all your sh machines are on Windows Server 2003, you're not part of the PowerShell community. 
Uh, you can read about that stuff, but you're not part of the community because it isn't going to help you. The PowerShell version, well, PowerShell just doesn't run on 2003. All the interesting stuff on PowerShell is happening in later versions of the OS. So as people get off those older OSs and pick up the later OSs, we're seeing a big increase in the number of users and the size of the community using PowerShell. Now, PowerShell in version two, in uh, 2015, notice here I'm not talking about a, a version of PowerShell. I'm just talking about PowerShell a lot. Because as you heard uh, Kenneth and Anko mention, we're making investments in PowerShell that will go down level. And I don't know if you caught this, it's not just down level versions of Windows. Like PowerShell version 5 will go to down level versions of the OS. Windows 7 and 2008 are 2 and above. What we also said is there are components of the, the health stuff we're doing that we think are so important, we're going to take those and we're going to bring them down level to previous versions of PowerShell. So the PowerShell um, uh, package manager, that will be available in previous versions of PowerShell. And there's, we're looking at some other components. But, so that's why I'm not laying this to a particular um, version. So we have PowerShell Package Manager and PS Get. This dramatically reduces the friction of both getting community components and for sharing them. So now all of a sudden it makes it easy to share. We got the PowerShell Script Analyzer and Pester. And what this does is it extends PowerShell. Look, what, what happened was a lot of people were very excited about PowerShell, but they said, but wait, I'm running my real production system here on it. Where's my, you know, how do I make sure that this is safe? And okay, well it's safe, but then somebody changed something. So is it still safe? And so in fact, uh, we had people internally who were like the, the, was it the link team. The link team was using PowerShell to manage all of Link Online, the whole thing, run Link Online. And so they went and wrote their own equivalent of script analyzer. So as people modified their scripts, they could make sure that they were adhering to their guidelines. And so obviously, we don't want everybody to go write their own parser and uh, uh, script analyzer. So script analyzer and the ability to generate unit tests now mean that people can write PowerShell in a way that can support production environments. They can make a change and feel safe that it's not just some scary thing, but they know that it's gonna work. Of course, desired state configuration platform and the res kit uh, now extends the community to the DevOps community. So what you're seeing here is that the community grows and grows. We're working on classes and posh tools. This is extending the community to the developers. And we're working on Linux version of desired state configuration. And oh my, that's our open version of WMI, open source version of WMI. Uh, this is extending uh, the community uh, to the Linux community as well. So there's just, uh, you know, things are going well. 2015, it just gets better. Uh, and by the way, that's just a small set of the things that we're doing in PowerShell in this, in this year. So as I said, the investments in, in Microsoft's investments in PowerShell will continue uh, and increase. Okay. So PowerShell going forward. PowerShell and Microsoft going forward. This really is a story of two influences. Uh, first is Satya, and the second is the cloud. These are the things that are driving everything that we do. Okay? Now, first, Satya. Uh, Satya is a, a fantastic new leader. I was telling someone at lunch, um, you know, uh, it's like gymnastics. The body follows the head. Okay? So gymnastics, you want to go that way, you move your head that way. Body's going to follow. Well, under Satya, we have a new leadership. And he's very clear. He's a very open guy. Um, and he's, he's changing things, right? I think this picture sums up the change more than anything I could say, right? And, and, and the main thing about this is that under Satya, you know, he, what he's saying is there's two things. First is it's a cloud-first, mobile-first world. And notice he didn't say it's a Windows cloud and a Windows phone first world. He didn't say that. He said cloud first and mobile first world. So this tells us where we're going. Then the other thing he constantly, constantly, constantly tells us is focus in on customers and focus in on customers using our products. 
So this is the where and the how. And when he talks about customer usage, he says, make sure customers use our products. Make sure they succeed with our products. Make sure they love our products, right? Don't, make, don't worry about getting them to order our products or buy our products or worry about monetization. Look, we got smart guys who can figure out that stuff. You engineers figure out the right products that make our customers successful and that they love and that they use and everything else will line up. Okay? Now here's the great thing about Satya. It's not bullshit. It's not. It's not. And it's not PR. And even better is it doesn't get diluted or interpreted as it makes its way down the, the, through the organization. I mean, sometimes that happens. Sometimes you're, the new lead will say, you know, new lead of an organization say, we're heading in that direction. And uh, then as it permeates down, the guy, you know, your executive says, yeah, we're eventually going to lead in that direction, but we're going to go this way, okay? We'll get there some other time. That is not happening at Microsoft. It's just wonderful. From, from Satya on down, on down, on down, the message stays the same, stays constant, and people have the courage to do that. I mean, we have these meet discussions. It's like, um, hey, we, should, we could do this or we could do that. And it's like, well, focus in on using you know, customer usage. Make sure customers are happy. Make sure they're using this. And it's like, well, but we don't know how to monetize that. So don't worry about that. We'll figure that out later. Just focus in on usage. And it's like, wow, it's real. So anyway, beautiful world. Love it. Um, now, in terms of the cloud first, this is the Cloud Design Center. And a lot of people, um, let me take a digression here. Uh, a lot of people hear cloud and they say, okay, I understand why you're doing that, but I don't, you know, I don't like that story because I'm not going to the cloud or I'm going to go to the cloud, but not for a couple of years. And here's the story I tell you. Here's the way to think about this. Um, Windows is by far the world's most successful enterprise operating system. In the past, that used to be a statement about desktop computers. Right? We were a fantastic desktop enterprise you know, operating system. And at some point, we said, hey, we're going to be a great server operating system. And at the time, people just thought we were insane, right? Because if you recall, the defining user experience about our desktop operating system was a feature we called the blue screen of death. <laughs> now, so here's the thing that people are experiencing this blue screen of death on a regular basis, and, and we're saying we're going to turn that into a server operating system? And they just looked at us like we were insane, like, like you got, that's never, ever, ever going to happen. You're just out of your mind. And yet today, 73% of every server built today will end today, this year, will end up with Windows Server on it. Okay? So we took a direction, we executed it, and you might say, oh, well, did you, you shifted your way around, uh, away from the desktop. And the answer was no. When was the last time you guys saw a blue screen to death? They still happen, but they're pretty rare. Our investments in the enterprise server operating system greatly benefited our enterprise desktop customers. In the same way that we shifted from the desktop to the server, we're shifting from an enterprise way of doing things to the cloud. Now let's just talk about that. Let's be real honest about that. As the world, the marketplace is shifting to the cloud, we have some of the world's largest services running on Windows. Bing, Azure, Office 365. But it's a statement of fact that when a startup company decides to do a, web, a cloud startup, Windows Server is not their operating system of choice. It's my job to change that and to make Windows be the operating system of choice for the cloud. Now, some people, again, look at us and say, yeah, that'll never happen. Let me tell you, the challenges I have in doing that are nothing compared to the challenges of taking a desktop operating system and turning it into an enterprise server. But we do need to make these cha changes. So part of this is changes in the way we manage. Part of this is changes to the operating system. So I don't know if you saw last week, but I announced the uh, nano server. Nano Server is a deployment option for Windows Server. It is 20 times smaller 
than server core, which is very small compared to full server. I mean, it's just crazy small, so lots of great stuff. But the key thing I want to point out is, you're going to hear us talk a lot about the cloud, and if you're sitting there in the enterprise, you need to realize that the vast majority, not all, not, definitely not all, but the vast majority of the things we're going to do to be a great cloud operating system are going to benefit you even if you don't use the cloud. Desired state configuration. Desired state configuration came explicitly from the analysis of how we needed to change to do great for the cloud. And the reality is, most of the people using desired state configuration are in the enterprise, just to state the fact. So don't worry about that. So we're going to talk a lot about the cloud. Don't worry. Is everybody beeping here? Like that. Okay, well, if you see some flood coming up the, the <laughs> elevators, you let me know. I got a foot on you, so. <laughs> it's been nice knowing you. Okay. So the Cloud Design Center. So we've got uh, Align, uh, Azure, and Windows Server Investments. We work together to decide what to work on. Uh, we're working together on things like compute, networking, storage, uh, Azure Pack. And I mentioned to you this uh, joint investment in Nano Server. This is a very, very small, very exciting version of, of uh, Windows Server. And of course, containers. That's a beautiful thing. Although, you, got, you just found out they don't like you, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, apparently, the phone company has that. They're boring people and less of them. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so in this, so we have a, this cloud design center. We're rethinking everything in terms of like, how do we do a great job for the cloud? Uh, and a lot of this has to do with management. So management is a, a lot of this has to do with the style of management. Okay, things need to be simple, simple, simple. DevOps guys have a fantastic phrase. They say the problem is scale times complexity exceeds our skill. Okay, so it has to be simple. Obviously, it has to be automated. This is where we got desired state configuration. Why we're doing the repository so it's easy to recreate environments. Why it's important to have unit tests for everything. Uh, we want to be able to light up Azure. So we're working with the Azure to have the desired state configuration extension agent. I don't know if you know. Can we have a little NDA here? No, no tweeting this one. But uh, you know Azure. Oh, on YouTube. Yeah. When is it going to go on YouTube? No, never mind. Come by me. Talk to me later. There's, we're doing some great stuff with the Azure team, working very closely. They're going to take dependencies on us. Wonderful stuff. And, and one of the reasons why we're supporting Linux, why we're taking desired state configuration moving into Linux, is because here's the thing to get in focus, is that in the context of Azure, Microsoft makes more money if you have 10 instances of Linux than if you have two instances of Windows. Okay? So in the context of Azure, what matters most is that you use our product, that you use it. It's volume, okay? volume, volume, volume. So we want to make it easy for you to consume as much computing as possible, whether it's Windows or Linux. Now, when I put my Windows hat on, I say, well, I prefer it to be Windows. But when I put my Microsoft hat on, I say, I'm going to make sure you're successful, whatever you choose. Okay. Now, uh, we are also using uh, Azure, we're leveraging Azure to do great management. And so you'll see more and more of our management services and management offerings taking advantage of the great capabilities in Azure. Fantastic scale, point of presence in 19 data centers across the world, fantastic reliability, et cetera, uh, to provide management services to on-premises uh, installations. Okay? If you're not familiar with Operations Insight, you install an agent on Operations, in Operations Insight agent on your on-premise servers, and we send the events up to the cloud where we do big data analytics. Anybody ever set up a big data analytics environment? Yeah, okay, guess what? Here's the deal. It's hard. It's hard. It's really hard. Who wants to do that? So you say, say hey, just send my data up there, and then you consume big data analytics, but you don't need to run big data analytics. We do that for you. 
So Azure Automation, that's obviously uh, PowerShell workflows running in the cloud, uh, Windows Backup, that's Windows Backup to Azure, Azure Site Recovery, Store Simple, the storage appliance, that's all managed through Azure of on-premise components. And then again, this ability to manage anything, anywhere. Okay, so that means I need to be able to manage Linux and Windows servers from Linux or Windows. Now obviously you've seen some of that. I assure you there's more to come. You can connect the dots, you can try and get it out of us, we won't tell you, but <laughs> you can connect the dots. And it's also one of the reasons why we're shifting our focus to web GUIs. Okay, so we're a big focus in on web GUIs. Why? And the answer is, because sometimes you're gonna be able to want to manage everything from Linux. Okay, so now let's talk about this customer usage. A lot of this has to do with listen to the customer, listen to the customer, listen to the customer. You know, when we took off three years, you know, we did some listening to the customers, and then we formulated our hypotheses, and you know, we did about a year of that, so we did a lot, a lot of listening to the customers, but then it was two years before we delivered on that. Okay, so yeah, we're listening to the customers, but only occasionally. Instead, we want to have a much more active engagement, more of a conversation. That, that environment was, you talk, I listen, now I leave, and then we talk again in a few years, right? Instead, we want to have these short conversations. Hey, what do you think? Okay, hold on. Hey, what about this? What about that? So we want to turn the pace up, you know? And that now affects our release cadence. That's why you see the WMF is released very frequently, and it led to some of the org changes that Angel and Kent talked about today. Next is we want to solve the customer's problem. Now here, this has direct effect on kind of platform and problem solving, okay? So we want to drill into this concept, platform and problem solving. So by and large, by and large, what we've been doing with PowerShell is pretty much of a platform play, okay? Now a platform play is really about providing a set of services to enable other people to solve problems. So in PowerShell version one, we provided a great set of services, but it was the exchange team that took those services, provided great exchange coverage, and allowed the, and solved the problem of how do I manage exchange at scale, okay? So then other teams did that and they were able to solve their problems. The PowerShell team itself wasn't solving those problems. The PowerShell team was enabling those guys. We were providing a platform for those other people to solve their problems. Obviously, one of the big, big uh, solution, problem solvers in this area, uh, VMware, right? So think about that. When you get the platform right, even folks that might not even like you will use you. Now, why is that? And the answer is when you have the right platform, you enable other people to do their best work at the least effort and make the most money. So that's what VMware did, right? They were not natural allies with Microsoft. And that they looked at PowerShell and they said, this is a platform form for us to do a little bit of work and we can really provide a great solution to our customers. And that's what they did. Okay, so when you have a platform, you have a let a thousand blossoms bloom mindset. Well, you might want to do it this way, you might want to do it this way. We're not really going to take a, a point of view. You want to be general purpose, you want to be open-ended, and pretty much policy-free. Now let me contrast that with problem-solving thinking. In problem-solving thinking, you're taking responsibility for addressing the customer's problem, okay? Now with this, you have to have a point of view. You don't want to say, oh, customer, here's 1,400 ways you can do something. It's like, uh, Kierkegaard called this the dizziness of freedom. When faced with too many choices, people stall, and they don't know what to do, and they get anxious. You want to be able to say, do it this way. Or you can do it this way if you want to do this, or that way if you want to do that. Great. You have a point of view. You focus in on the scenarios that you want to do. It's no longer general purpose. You're trying to solve a set of scenarios. And you engineer encounters with the real world. You've got an idea in your head. Might be right, might be wrong. Go take that idea, get it out in the real world, and, re and respect reality. Like, reality is out there. You need to respect it. Find out, does your idea, how does it map to the real world, and change when reality is telling you something. 
Now, in reality, we sort of always did that, but it's really a percentage thing. So by and large, when we started, it's largely platform thinking, a little bit of problem solving. And what you're going to see is a shift. We are not switching from a platform team to a problem solving team. We're taking a team that's going to do more problem solving. And that's the way I think you should think about some of the things we're doing. We decided it was a problem. Unit testing was a problem that we needed to solve. We did it with Dave's code, but we felt it was important for us to have a point of view. It's, by the way, one of the reasons why you might say, well, hey, Dave's code's out there. Why did you need to, why did you need to butt in? And we felt it was important for Microsoft to take a point of view, to tell the world this is the framework to use, Everyone should rally behind this, and we're going to support it. So you don't have to say, yeah, Dave, that guy looks pretty dodgy. Could look pretty good, but I don't know. You, know? <laughs> you can say, eh, Microsoft, eh, they look pretty dodgy. No, anyway, so you know, obviously, coming from Microsoft, it carries a bit more weight. Okay? So anyway, that's a, an example of the problem solving. So I mentioned to you, largely what I've been talking about here are influences directly related to Sacha and his leadership style and the mission that he gave people and the fact that that leadership, that mission, has remained true and we're executing on it. And I gotta tell you, everybody just loves it. As an engineer, we're all engineers, right? We just love to write code and have people use it and have people be successful with it. I gotta tell you, I do a lot of conferences. My favorite part of every conference is when people tell me how they use the product and then got a raise. Someone told me that today. Oh, I use your product, I got a raise. I'm over in heaven, man. I love it when we can make people successful. So this, so anyway, people just, engineers just love this new world where we're focusing on making people successful with our code. So, so but then there's the cloud. So let's talk about the cloud. So really the cloud influences a lot of stuff. Fabric, new way to think about the fabric, new way to think about applications, new way to think about management. I'm gonna give you just a, a couple examples of this and how it changes the, uh, the change in platform thinking to problem solving manifests itself. So first I'm gonna give you two examples in the fabric space. First is cloud platform solution. So cloud platform, platform solution, we call the CPS. Uh, CPS is one to four racks, sort of a cloud in a box. Are people familiar with that? A little bit? Okay. Uh, so basically, instead of saying, oh, how do I do this? You go and you say, I'd like a cloud in a box. And we'll say, how many racks would you like? One, two, three, or four? You say, I'd like three racks. And you get three racks and you get all the software to build it and just, and just run it. Okay? So it's a literally cloud in a box SKU. System Center has what? It's like 40 VMs all configured to interoperate and provide you a full cloud in a box. This is a very complicated thing. Now, in order to deliver that, um, we have a bunch of developers. It's entirely configured using PowerShell. So, yay, you know, PowerShell's up to the, when, when the going gets tough, the tough turn to PowerShell. However, <laughs> However, it was uh, entirely configured by PowerShell by a group of developers. And here was a problem. The developers didn't like PowerShell. They didn't like it. I had a guy on the team like, yeah, I want to get off this project. Oh, why? This is the most exciting thing going on. I said, yeah, I want PowerShell. Really? Let's talk about that. So the devs didn't like PowerShell, and desired state configuration was really too early for us to use. It wasn't up to the, to the task because we started this a long time ago. Um, so, we then drilled in. Okay, well, why don't you like PowerShell? I mean, again, style, Angel has it like, oh, you like chocolate, I like vanilla. Is it like that or, or what? Because if it's like, you just like chocolate and we got vanilla, nothing to do. But we drilled in. Okay, well, what, what is it? We were open to that, respect reality. We're open. Okay, tell us what the problem is. One of the big problems was this idea of shell semantics. And we all know exactly what this means, right? You, know, you write that script and you say return x, but somewhere in your code you did something that emitted an object and that ended up in the pipeline too. Like, if you're a shell guy, you, you know that. By the way, the return state was just a misstep. We shouldn't have done that. But, but the idea that anywhere in a script you emit an object and that gets emitted to the return value, that's typical shell semantics. Admins get that. 
developers put a return statement there. They expected that return statement to be respected. And when it wasn't, their head exploded. My head explodes at that too. I hate that sort of thing. Anyway, so what we did was, fine. We are now interacting we, with classes. We introduced classes. So developers like classes, yay. But with classes come a new programming construct. It's a much more strict construct. So when you, uh, when you use classes, you have to declare the return type of your method. You have to have a return statement. And if you admit anything in the object, in the, in the thing, it gets thrown away. So that's what developers were looking for. So developers didn't like it because it had shell semantics. Now we solved that problem. Next is, it wasn't in Visual Studio. Developers like Visual Studio. This ISC thing? Well, OK, but I'm a Visual Studio guy. And it's not Visual Studio, so, so I don't like it. Like, oh, but it's great. But it's not Visual Studio, so I don't like it. So now, we got Posh Tools, Visual Studio integration. Thank you, Andre. Hey, this is great, but I'm a developer. This thing has to work, right? You pay me a lot of money. I, I have to work. If it doesn't work, I'm going to be in trouble. There's no unit test framework. There's no ability to analyze the script. I had one of the executives come to me and say, wait a second, wait a second. I just saw some really crappy PowerShell code. They're doing this. Isn't there some way I can check all those scripts and make sure they're not doing that? I said, yeah, wouldn't that be a good idea? So, <laughs> so we're shipping Pester, and uh, we're building an operation. Oh, I didn't even get to that part yet. So uh, we're building, we're shipping Pester in Windows, and we're going to build an operation validation test on top of Pester. I don't know if we talk about that, but it's not just for testing your code. The idea is we want to get CPS to a particular stage, and before we go to the next stage of development, we want to say, hey, is Active Directory working? Is this connected to that? Is that connected to that? Is my unit all in a particular operational state? And if so, great, go to the next stage. Now test it out here. We'll want to use Pester for that. Okay. There we go. This was the node code tooling. And so obviously we, we picked up the script analytics to be able to analyze the code and make sure that all the code adheres to a style guide. DSC was not up to the task, and we have just, you know, just poured, you know, put the pedal to the metal on DSC. So this is DSC plus plus plus. There used to be a toolkit called the PowerShell Deployment Toolkit. This would take System Center and deploy it using workflow. Uh, we took the guy who wrote that, we enlisted him uh, to redo it for CPS uh, and say, hey, use desired state configuration. And so he's been writing a lot of the resources, telling us, hey, here's where you've got a problem, here's where it isn't up to snuff, and just providing us a lot of great feedback. So again, an example where, oh, sorry, and then it was hard to find community feedback. So we got PSGET and Package Manager. So again, here's an example where there was something we wanted to do for the cloud. We encountered a problem, and instead of saying, well, all, anybody can do these things, well, not anybody can do these things. Most anybody can do these things, leave it up to them. The team took responsibility and solved these problems. In the area of security, we have a problem. And the problem is that the bad guys love PowerShell, right? And why do they love PowerShell? Well, of course, they have exquisite taste in tools. <laughs> so there's that. Uh, but the other is that PowerShell is a very powerful language, and they were able to do uh, just extraordinary stuff uh, with a very small amount of code. And there was a gap in our auditing and logging that they were able to do so in a way that was not traceable. So it gave them great operational security. Basically, the ability to go out to the internet, grab a piece of code, compile it in memory, execute it without ever touching the disk, and then going away and leaving out a trace. Okay? So the background here is we've seen you know, increase in the number of malware occurrences using PowerShell. Uh, the ability to mention to you that that ability to run code in memory <coughs> gave them a great operational security. Uh, as part of our planning, we had switched from a protect the si system mindset to a, an assume breach mindset. In an assume breach mindset, it is assume the bad guy's already in. The task then is to be able to detect them, evict them, and fix things up. Okay? Um, and that we didn't have any solutions. Um, sorry, we had solutions like anti malware and intrusion detection, et cetera, but they didn't have sufficient coverage. In other words, we weren't generating the events that allowed them to detect people. 
So this is something Lee Holmes has just been, did a great job with this release on for once. No, <laughs> uh, really, this has just been a great release for security. Uh, so PowerShell malware, you know, I don't know if you've seen this, right? There's stories about people, machines getting hacked using PowerShell. Uh, now, uh, Lee worked with the anti-malware team, and now anti-malware will scan PowerShell, force PowerShell code. It's actually all scripting languages, uh, but he led that effort, so that's great. Uh, dynamic code doesn't get logged, so now we have a group policy for deep script block logging, so all those things will get logged, so they won't be able to operate in silence. Connecting as a run as, if you connect to a run as endpoint, we didn't log who was actually doing it. We just logged the run as account. So now the logging includes both who connected to the user and who they're running as. Um, it was very difficult to thread together what actions were performed on the system. So these big data analytics, like okay, I send things to the log and then I move it to the, something in the cloud and I do a search against it. But what happens when I got like 20 people connected to a server and they're all interoperating things? You know, it's all in the event log. Can you figure out what's going on? And I said, good luck, my friend. I don't think so. So we added transcripting. Okay, so we added, you know, transcripting, star transcript. That would only work in the console, but now it works in every environment. Wherever the PowerShell engine is hosted, you can now do transcripting. We have the ability to do system transcripting. And system transcripting says every single session on the system gets transcripted. By transcript, by the way, everything you type and everything gets output gets sent to a file. So then you go to this directory and you see all the files. I can then follow. You're all, 20 people are doing something, I'm gonna have 20 files, and for each person I see what they did and what happened, okay? So, and we have a group policy for this. And the system uh, transaction, they can't turn that off. Uh, logs, no. With these logs, logs can contain sensitive data. So again, we invented this mechanism, secure logging, what do you call it? Protected event logging. So the event logs can be encrypted and forwarded. So you go to the event log and you see the messages and there it's all encrypted text. And then it gets forwarded to some place and they can decrypt the log to do the big data analytics. And then he did that and, and that was a great example of we had a problem, we solved it, but then the way he did it was uh, he did it in a general purpose platform way. So he generated these you know, generic cryptographic message encryption and decryption commandlets because then anything that you have that has sensitive data, you can use these commandlets to encrypt and decrypt. And lastly, uh, PowerShell full language subverts whitelisting. So a lot of, if you want great security, what you do is you whitelist things, but in reality, if you've got PowerShell full language, you can get around that. So now what he does is when we detect that the system is in whitelisting mode, uh, PowerShell automatically converts to constrained language mode to up the security. So again, another example where we had a set of problems in, in security, and then instead of just resorting back to the, well, that sucks, we're a platform team, we went and took on responsibility to solve those as a set of problems. So, almost done here. These were the futures. My 2014 talk, I gave a set of predictions about what the future held for us. I predicted faster cycles. I think you've seen that. I predicted even better community engagement. I heard a lot about that today. Uh, I focus in on developers and DevOps style of management. And again, the base assumption for all this was that we believe that people have more business value when they use more computing. So what our mission is, is to make it easy to reduce the friction that you can consume your uh, you know, appropriate level of computing, right? That it shouldn't be, oh, I'd love to be able to do all these great things, but boy, setting up a big data system is really, really hard. Oh, I'd like to do this, but setting up each incremental server is really, really hard. Our mission is to make it easy, uh, for you to do that. I think you've seen our investments in that area. Again, these are my investments, my predictions from 2014. I had predicted that we would open source PowerShell, and here are my predictions this year. Predictions for this year. 
I predict faster life cycles, even better community engagement. Focus in on developer and DevOps. Base assumption will be that business increases with increased computing. Our mission is to minimize the risk and effort to consume tons of computing. And I predict at some point we'll have open source PowerShell. So not a whole lot of change. One big change, however, is that there will be a greater focus on actually solving the problems and less of a focus on, on um, uh, platform. So PowerShell going forward. I'm crazy optimistic about the community. Again, part of the thing about platform, a platform, let me give the example of VMware. Why did VMware do this? And the answer is we had given them a platform where they could do a little bit of work and do their best work on our platform to really solve customers' problems. You have that same platform. My community has that platform. And they are using that platform, they've got it dialed in, and they are doing some of the best work they have on our platform and sharing it with each other. So I'm just very optimistic about the community. You will see continued and increased investment from Microsoft in this area for two reasons. One is that we're perfectly aligned with Satya's mission and the requirements of the cloud. So that's it. That's our road. Thank you, sir. Uh, did you push the button? I did not. Okay, well, you didn't push it coming up here, so we won't make you do it on the way down. <laughs>